Okay, welcome back for part two. Let's go, Rob. Uh, great, Doug. Thank you. So we've talked about what the components are of a really good, I don't like the word ideal, I don't like the word perfect, but a, but a very reasonable, healthy ketogenic diet. One comment at the beginning of this is, and I think uh, um, I've blogged about this a little bit, but this is important to understand that this great uh, Low Carb USA West Palm Beach talk, we had a guy from, um, I think his name was Lowry, Dr. Lowry from yeah, UCF. Lowry, was, yeah. yeah, was talking, um, and he said something very interesting. They do a lot of work um, with the Tampa Bay Lightning, with big athletes, and they did an experiment uh, at their institution where they took two groups of rats. They were um, longevity experiments. So they basically took rats from birth to death, and they took two groups. And the first group, they fed the standard American diet, the food pyramid diet, high carbohydrate, low fat diet, okay? Nothing out of the ordinary. The second group of rats, they fed a ketogenic diet. And they looked at two things. They looked at diseases that these animals got, and they looked at how long they lived. We can talk about the diseases later, but what they found, and what he stood up there and he said, is he said, the rats on the ketogenic diet lived basically double the length, their lifespan was basically double the length of the lifespan of the, of the rats on the, on the standard American diet. So the ketogenic diet prolongs your life. That was his conclusion from the study. And at the question time, I stood up and I said, I loved your talk, but you're absolutely 100% wrong. You're incorrect about the longevity study. And there was this gasp from the audience. And I said, here's the issue. The ketogenic diet is normal. That's how long these rats are supposed to live. Right, I remember. Okay? The ketogenic diet is the best scenario. It's not they're living longer. That's how long they're supposed to live. Right. The standard American diet is a diet of disease, and it shortens your life. And, and that is a critical change in our thinking. Because the data is the data, but how we interpret it is so important. We should stop trying to prove that the ketogenic diet is better we need to start looking at is all the other crap that we're eating is killing us and shortening our life. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and it's a critical concept. So what I'm about to talk about is called normal. This is how we are optimally supposed to function. And there are little tweaks, there are little nuances. We can, we can discuss and argue, okay, uh, 99 versus 100%. But ultimately what I'm about to talk about is the healthiest way to live. And the reason it's the healthiest way to live is because this is how human beings are designed to live. Biologically, this is the way we function. And from an evolutionary and a natural selection perspective, this is the point we've come to. And when we fight, it, when we fight against that, guess what? Natural selection is going to take us out. So the ketogenic diet is the healthy way to live. Everything else shortens life. So that's the first preamble to this. The second thing that we talked about is perfection is the enemy of good enough. I, I really have an issue, and I understand people are trying to figure this out and people love what they're doing, but I really have some concerns about the keto evangelists, the people that are standing on their soapbox and saying, this is the best thing since sliced bread. Well, sliced bread is not a good example, but this is the greatest thing ever. It's a panacea of health. No, there's still a lot of other diseases there. Everybody's going to die, okay? So don't think of this as everything but it is a significant component of health. And it's the single best thing you can do to live the healthiest life you can, both emotionally and physically. So it's important to put it into that, con into that context. But don't be the evangelist. If, if evangelism is the way you, you get your kicks, that's fine. But don't become the equivalent of a vegan. Please don't do that. Love what you do, but don't do that. Okay? And don't try to tell other people what they have to do. Tell other people what you're doing. And let them decide for themselves. Hey, this is how I live my life. I'm not going to tell you to do this, okay? But here's another piece of bullshit. And I use that word medically because I'm a doctor. I can use that word. Mm -hmm. The bullshit is this. I just use rats as an example. The reason scientists or the, the ideology of scientists using rats is they look at the rats as being exactly the same. So if all rats are the same, we know genetically they're not. But if all rats are the same, then if we do this one thing and this other thing to two different groups, we can measure the effect of that specific thing. We don't take into account the individual variability of each rat. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And yet, people love to stand up there and say, oh, all humans are different. All people are different. 
Well, I understand what they're saying, but for the most part, it's bullshit. All human beings, all human beings are optimally designed to use a ketogenic diet, period. All human beings are optimally designed to breathe air. That's pretty obvious. Okay? So don't tell me that there are individual variances. Okay, I might not liver, you, like liver, you might like liver. But ultimately, we are still the same as those rats in a cage. We perform as a species the same. And there are certain things that will harm all of us. There's no individual variability. There may be slight differences, but we are more common than we are different, particularly when it comes to nutrition. And that's an important concept. Yes, there is a range of behavior that's useful for the survival of the species, but ultimately we are very, very, very similar, all of us, in terms of how we behave and what's best for us. So it's important to consider that. If you're the one person that's in this platoon that's in step and everybody else is out of step, maybe it's the other way around. So we've got to consider that as we look at this. And those are just pieces that we have to have some humility about what we do, but we've got to understand that this is the best for everybody, whether we choose to do that or not. Okay. So now you've come to the conclusion that you're fat and you've come to the conclusion based on, on looking at the early chapters of this, that you have a substance abuse problem and you have that ownership and you want to kill your best friend. Who's your best friend, Doug? Carbohydrates. carbohydrates. A fat person's best friend is carbohydrates because you shove your husband, your wife, or your best friend out of the way to get to the ice cream. So the question is, are you willing to kill your best friend? And that's the wrong question. Are you willing to try to kill your best friend? Because in addiction management, nobody is ever successful the first time. You don't just crumple up the cigarettes and quit smoking. We try we do well for a little while, we screw up. We learn from the screw up, we try again, we try again, we try again. The average smoker takes three to five attempts to eventually completely quit smoking. And inherent to a ketogenic diet, because it's a way of life, we have to understand that we're gonna make mistakes, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> the other thing is this, because it's a transformation in a way of life, don't do it like this. You cannot get up and run a marathon. You can try, you probably won't, but the next day you're gonna feel awful. And if you say, today's the day, today's my quit day, I'm going to quit today and I'm going to start a ketogenic diet tomorrow, you're going to crash and burn. You're going to hate it. You're going to feel like crap. And guess what? When you feel like crap, you're going to abandon it. If you do this progressively, if you take your body through slow steps and you adapt your body, it's called fat adapting. If you slowly allow the systems in your body, the bad ones, the carbohydrate ones to ramp down, and the fat-burning, keto-burning ones to ramp up. If you slowly transform your body and you take little baby steps every day, you're going to eat the elephant in little bites. And that's the first starting point. However, fat people, no matter what I tell you, are obsessed about the scale. And they want to see the scale move immediately. So again, I'm going to reiterate this. If you do, if you approach this transformation in a stepwise approach, don't expect the scale to move radically right away. It may move for about five to 10 pounds, depending on how heavy you are, because of water weight that you shed. Because every molecule of sugar retains a molecule of water. So every fat person, by definition, is fluid overloaded. So you lose weight very quickly by dropping that fluid. But then, for a, for a good four to six weeks, you're not going to see a major drop in your weight because your body's keto adapting, it's fat adapting, especially if you do it progressively. And then once you get into that deep ketosis, your body melts away. And you can smell it, you can taste it, you can feel it. Yeah, you may want to pee on pea purple or use a keto monitor, but ultimately you're going to know. I don't need a monitor or a stick to pee on to tell me what I put in my mouth. So you may want to measure that as a better reward than getting on the scale to begin with to prove that you're doing the right thing. But ultimately, the way to go is just know what you're doing. And, and be very human about it. Understand your flaws. Understand that every step is a way to go, and you're not going to be perfect until you arrive there. Okay, so that's the first common understanding. Now let's start. Where do we start? There are four areas that we're going to work toward, and I'm going to set the final goal, and then I'm going to talk about how to get there. Okay? The first thing is this, and we've talked about it already, and I cannot overemphasize this. We've got to let go of our fears. We've got to get let go of our lipophobia, our fear of fat, and we have to let go of the fact that salt is bad for us. Those are two critical things. So let's start with salt. By definition, when you eat carbohydrates, 
every molecule of sugar is attached to a molecule of water and you become, when you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, you store a lot of fluid. And then when that sugar gets turned to fat by your, by your liver, you're left with all this redundant fluid. That's where your hypertension comes from, by the way. So nobody has essential hypertension. It's carbophiliac hypertension. But you've got all this excess fluid in your tissues, in your blood. The way the body copes with excess fluid is it pees out salt. It's the only way you can get rid of, rid of excess water. So by definition, the fat person who's been told to stay away from salt because it causes hypertension is eating a ton of carbohydrates, they're fluid overloaded, and they're sodium deficient. So how the hell do you get rid of the water? Well, once you go on a ketogenic diet, now your body starts peeing out all that salt and your sodium goes even lower. It starts low and it goes even lower. The human body is designed to use salt to manage fluid volume. So the very first thing you want to do with your very first meal is add salt and don't ever stop adding salt. The human body can cope with a tremendous amount of excess of salt, but it cannot cope with too little. And a large part of the negative symptoms, the headaches, the constipation, that's because of a sodium deficiency. Your blood pressure will not go up. Your heart rate will come down. Your blood pressure may go up slightly and then come down, but it'll never be toxic. Eat salt, you'll get rid of the water. And that's how you'll shed your first five to 10 pounds in the first week or two that you start this. It's that excess water weight. And it is critically important that you get rid of that. When people say they're sleeping better, they're feeling better, it's because of that early fluid loss. So that's the first step. Eat salt. Okay? So salt is important. The second thing that we get into, the goal of the ketogenic diet. And remember, we talked about the addiction component. So we're talking specifically about obesity. The goal of obese people in terms of carbohydrate consumption is zero. Zero. You don't need a calculator to measure zero. There is no allowance for carbohydrates on a ketogenic diet if you're fat. Every diet out there has some allowance built into it, whether it's 30 grams, whether it's net carbs, whether it's 50 grams of total carbs. You've got to count this. You've got to count. Garbage. Your body doesn't work that way. The goal is zero. And the reason why I'm adamant and I've repeated that so often is because I absolutely do not want you to build an allowance. I've only eaten zero the whole day, but my allowance is 30 grams or 40 grams. Let me have a little bit of chocolate to be in that. Or I've only eaten five the whole day. I can eat a chocolate chip cookie and still be under my 30 grams. The problem with that is now you've got chocolate chip cookies in your house. <laughs> and by definition, you've lost the ability to control the relationship. So guess what? You're not just going to eat one especially if, if you're bored or if you're upset. If they're there, you're going to eat them. If zero is the goal, you don't need that chocolate there. You don't need that stuff there. Okay? So that's the starting point. The starting point is not to not eat carbohydrates. The starting point is to not to have them around. So the goal is zero. Now, the reality is there are certain things that we eat and drink that have incidental carbohydrates in them. And I want you to have an exquisite awareness of the incidentals. So, for example, when I'm drinking coffee, I put a little bit of whole milk or some cream in my coffee. Typically, there's two grams of carbohydrates in the milk I put in my coffee. Guess what? That counts. So we have a number, but it's critically important. The number is not the same as a ketogenic diet. We like people to be, even for the incidentals, under a total of 30 grams per day of total, not net, but total carbohydrates. So for example, if I'm drinking that coffee, if I have four cups of coffee a day, that's eight grams. That counts toward my 30. And I've got to be aware of that. But it do, it's not an allowance. The goal is zero. The next point is this. You don't get to zero right away. Because to go from 80 plus percent of your calories being carbohydrate to zero is almost impossible overnight. And you're going to feel awful. So what we do in order to get to zero is we use a stepwise approach. Remember, the ketogenic lifestyle and dealing with this from an addiction perspective, all about breaking habits and creating new ones. It's about rehabituation. Well, you cannot break a habit if you're still doing it. And you cannot form a new habit if you're not doing it on a regular basis. And it takes about 90 days to consolidate habits, to habituate, either to get used to a broken habit or to create a new one. And that's an important addiction management concept, the 90-day concept. Okay? So what we do is we divide the sources of carbohydrates into four categories. 
The first easiest category, and every one of these is difficult to begin with, but it takes about two weeks to get used to this, are the calories, and I don't like to use that word, but the calories in our drinks, basically the carbohydrates in what we drink. So the first step is to get rid of all the calories, all the carbohydrates in anything you drink. So out goes the Coke, in comes the, and always have a replacement. What I'm looking for you to do is to have anywhere from six to eight to 10 different things in your fridge and your pantry to drink that contain zero carbohydrates. Because when you open the fridge and all you got is water, you're going to go out and buy the Coke. But if you open the fridge, ah, oh, damn, there's no Coke. But I've got a Diet Coke, I've got a Fresca, I've got some Propel, I've got some water, I've got some Mio, I've got some, some Clear. I've got a variety. Which one do I want? And then you've forgotten about the Coke. So number one, restock your fridge with a whole bunch of different things that contain zero calories. And it doesn't matter whether they, the, the experts out there, tell you it's healthy for you. I don't care if it's orange juice, apple juice, cranberry juice. It's still crystal meth. There's more sugar in orange juice than there is in a can of Coke. Okay? So bear that in mind. The rule is you drink for hydration, zero calories. Now, to extend that rule a little further, specifically for obese people, and not everybody falls into this category, we never, ever, ever want you drinking your calories. I don't care if it's a smoothie, if it's V8 juice, if it's a vegetable thing that you've processed yourself. I don't even care if it's soup. If it runs through a fork and it contains calories, even if they're not sugar, it's not okay to consume them, especially at the beginning. Drink for hydration, eat for food. And that is a critical rule because you can drink endlessly when it comes to calories. So please stay away from that, okay? So the first step is this. And, and what I did is I went from Coke. I wasn't a big fan of Diet Coke, although Diet Coke's absolutely fine. It's not perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than Coke. So if you're doing heroin, you might need some methadone to come off the heroin. If you're doing regular Coke, use the Diet Coke. Water's better, but if you need the Diet Coke or if you need Splenda, I have no issue with artificial sweeteners if they prevent you from consuming the sugar. Now, if you find that the artificial sweeteners are a step toward drinking sugar, hey, you know what? Stay away from them. But the majority of people don't. And the majority of people can use artificial sweeteners to replace the sugar. Is it perfect? No. But you get used to that, and then you can give up the sugar. The critical thing is getting rid of the sugar in your drinks. From a personal perspective, I went from drinking a case of Coke a day, and I decided what I wanted to drink was coffee. Now, even my coffee had four or five spoons of sugar in it, and I went to none. So I either drink my coffee black or with whole milk or a little bit of cream in it. That was one of the most disgusting things I ever drank at first. It was disgusting. But what you want to do, and this is critically important, you want to consciously force yourself to develop a relationship with that thing that you think might work for you. And for about two weeks, I wrestled with my coffee, but I forced it down. After two weeks, hey, this is not so bad. After three weeks, it's like, where's my coffee? Now, after 15 years, you get between me and your, my coffee and you are dead. Don't get there, okay? So my coffee's my mainstay. And if I look at a can of Coke now, that's disgusting. How the hell can anybody drink that? So a whole approach transforms. Don't think I'll never have this again. Okay, once you de develop that arrogance, it's called arrogant integrity, that that stuff you used to love to have is now disgusting, you'll never want it again. It's a little bit like the, the guy that quit smoking. Oh my God, I need a cigarette. I'm not allowed to have one. 10 years later, that's disgusting. How the hell can you smoke? And that's the transformation. So don't think forever. Forever will happen if you're away from it long enough. So the first category, start with the drinks. I don't care what else you eat and drink for, that, for those couple of weeks. And whether it's one week, two weeks, three weeks, that's fine. The next category, once you've consolidated the drinks, the next category of carbohydrates that I move into is getting rid of what I call the vehicle foods, vehicle like a motor car. There is a bunch of carbohydrates, particularly the starches, that we put real food on top of to eat. So if you think about a hamburger, a hamburger is a bun that we put real food inside of to be able to eat it with our hands. A tortilla, a taco, rice, potatoes, we put real food on top of it. Well, guess what? It becomes pretty easy not to eat the vehicle. The difference is this, and this is where the next rule comes in. The difference is this, is that those foods, the breads and the tortillas and things, make it convenient, the burrito, to eat it with your hands. 
So the next rule I have when you're doing the keto transformation, and I try to make this an exclusive rule, I only ever want you to eat meals. The definition of a meal is sitting at a table with a plate of food and a knife and fork. Because it's difficult to eat a hamburger without the bun with your hands. You need a plate, you need a knife and fork. Difficult to drive while you're eating that hamburger without the bun, but you shouldn't be eating your car. And, oh my God, Doc, I, 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 I'm too busy. You don't understand. I, I work. This is exactly the point. If you are too busy to sit at a table and eat a plate of food with a knife and fork, you will not die of anorexia if you skip that meal. And if you're about to drive and blow away, just call me. I've never had that phone call. So get used to the fact that if I'm so busy, I, don't, I can't make time to sit down and have that meal. I'm okay. I don't need to eat. All because it's 12 o'clock. It doesn't mean you have to have lunch. We've got to break the concept of timed eating. You want to get away from that because that's not how the human body works. You'll find over time that there will be specific times when you do get hungry, you need to eat. For me, it's mostly sometime in the evening. And that's fine. Plan your meal around that. But get away from eating at those timed meals. So create that concept of a meal. The caveat to that, and we've talked about snacks being an emotional event always. A snack is always an emotional event. Your body doesn't need it. Your brain needs the high. So at first, if you want to do a little bit of pepperoni or cheese as a snack instead of um, the pretzels or the Coke or the, or the chips, that's fine. But the single best thing to use as that bridge across that moment where you need a snack is to develop your relationship with your fluid. My wife's always got a bottle or something with some crystal light in it. I've always got a cup of coffee around. That's my bridge. That has become my snack. So create that as a habit. That's the next thing I want you to do as you go through that drinking part. But get rid of the starches that you put food on top of. And that'll include all your grains, your pastas, your rices, your potatoes, your breads, your tortillas. And I don't care if it's a spinach tortilla. It's still flour. Get rid of those vehicles. And that's tough. You've got to be a little bit creative. You can eat what goes inside the burrito, except for the rice, but don't eat the burrito. So when I go to a Mexican restaurant and I'm eating fajitas, the fajitas will come out. I'll take all the condiments, just dump them on the plate, and I use a knife and fork to eat it. Just no rice. Everything else is fair, fair game. But no tortillas, no rice, no tacos, no rice. And you can eat everything that goes inside. If you're eating curry and rice, you can eat the curry. If you're eating meatballs and spaghetti, eat the meatballs. They're creative ways to eat. If you're eating with an iPhone fork, you can get the real food in minus the carbohydrates. And that takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of adapting. You have to be a little bit creative. There are in some of the keto recipes, and here's an important concept. And I've tried them, and I have an issue with them. We're talking specifically about obesity, where we're trying to break habits. So there are people out there that say, oh, I'm going to do a cauliflower pizza crust because I want pizza. Or I'm going to do an avocado bread made of avocado and egg. Yes, it's keto. It doesn't contain carbohydrates, but it's still bread. It's probably a bad idea for the recovering alcoholic to have no duels. So please try to, work, try to develop an eating pattern where you stay away from lookalikes. Stay away from cauliflower rice. Stay away from cauliflower pizza. If I want the cheese that goes onto the pizza, I'll take slices of cheese, stick them on a plate, stick them in the microwave. I'll stick some macadamia nuts or pepperoni on the cheese and eat it with a fork. But I don't do the base. I try to stay away from the concept of bread, of zucchini pasta. Eat zucchini. Chop it up like a zucchini and eat it that way. Stay away from the lookalikes because you're trying to break that habit. Now, the other people who are just trying to eat keto, that's fine. If you're a skinny person trying to be healthier, fine. But the fat person needs to stay away from the concepts. There is no such thing as a keto ice cream. They love to pitch it. It doesn't exist. Why? First of all, they can't make it. Secondly, a dessert, the concept of dessert is always for our head. It has no nutritional value. Dessert is always an emotional event at the end of a meal. It is not a nutritional event. So we want to get rid of those concepts. And yes, I know that there's a lot of austerity attached to that. But start going through that divorce as well. And over time, you learn to eat real food as it appears on your plate. You won't need the lookalikes. But you'll preserve the lookalikes. And then when you're at a place where all they've got is pizza, you say, ah, you know what, I'll just have a little bit. I'll have one slice. And you're screwed because it's permission. 
So the first step is to get rid of the, the, the calories in your drinks. The second step is to get rid of the starches or the vehicle foods. Once you've consolidated that, once you've made that change, the next step, and for some people this is the most difficult one, depending on if you're a starch or a sweet eater, get rid of the snacks. The chocolates, the chips, the pretzels, the popcorns, um, the candies, all those little things that we snack on. Get rid of them. There is no substitute. So a lot of the keto people will say, well, as long as it doesn't contain carbohydrates, you want your little stick of cheese, you want your pepperoni, you want your, it's still a snack, guys, if you're trying to lose weight. It's still calories for your head. So it is important to try to make that change. Stay away from putting, because your body doesn't need it. By this time, you're going to be close to being in ketosis. Your body doesn't need that, but your brain does. Get out your coffee, get out your crystal light, get out your Mio, whatever it may be. Sip on that. Go off and do something, and you won't need that snack. And that's a tough stage. Once you've consolidated that, the fourth stage is getting rid of fruit. The only fruits that we allow are tomatoes and avocados. All other fruit is on the no list, and that includes to begin with, at the start, the blueberries, the strawberries, the so-called low glycemic load uh, uh, berries. Stay the hell away from them for two reasons. Number one, if you've got a pound of blueberries in your fridge, you're going to do drive-bys. You're going to treat it like a snack. And that's the issue. The second thing is, early on, when your ketosis is still fragile, it's going to knock you out. And it's very difficult to recover. Down the road, in stage two, We'll talk about berries and we'll put them in their place. But right now, stay the hell away from them. The other concept, nuts, nuts and seeds, excellent source of um, protein, fat, uh, and even just a little bit of carbohydrate, but we'd ignore that. The problem with nuts, if you have them in the house and you're doing drive-bys, get rid of them. I have no problem with nuts in your salad or some almond on your salmon that you're eating, almond slices. I have no problem with nuts as a meal but I have a problem if you're going back and forth and snacking on them. Because remember, the goal here is to reduce, comfortably reduce your caloric consumption and not eat for protracted periods of time. Well, if you snack on those nuts, even though they don't contain carbohydrates, your liver will still store some of them. And the next concept is an important concept because we're going to move forward on this. The goal is to establish ketosis. The goal is to establish ketosis from your own fat. Your percentage of fat in your diet needs to go up, and it'll progressively go up as you remove the carbohydrates. We're going to talk about this in a second. But the four stages are of removing the carbohydrates, of getting to zero. Get rid of the sugars in your drinks. Get rid of the vehicle foods. Get rid of the snacks and the chips and the, and the pretzels. Get rid of the fruit. And you will approach zero carbohydrates. Simultaneously with zero carbohydrates, we want you to select food based on its fat content. So if you're going to be eating any meats, try to get the fattest meat that you can. It requires an accommodation. But if you're going to eat beef, go for the ribeye, go for the whitest ground beef. If you're going to eat uh, pork products, go for the bacon, go for the ribs, go for the highest fat. If you're going to eat um, chicken or, or any fa uh, fowl, try to get the skin and the dark meat rather than the white meat. If you're going to go with a fish, get the sardines, get the salmon, get the fattest fish. If you can, always try to select the fattest cut of food. But the problem in America on a practical perspective is no matter how, how much you try to select the fat, they've cut that away. So the second thing is always, 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 whatever you're eating, fat fortify. Think of certain fats as ways you can increase the fat content of anything you're about to eat. One of the substances is quite a long list. And I have these in my fridge, in my pantry, on my table. What are they? The soluble ones. Butter real butter, mayo, regular mayo, not light mayo. And you know what? Hellman's is okay. There are a little bit higher fat, lower carbohydrate uh, 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 mayos, but the carbohydrate in Hellman's mayo counts toward your 30 grams. But mayo is fine. Olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil. Those are excellent. Heavy cream, whole milk. The next ones are, and you don't have to eat them all, avocado, bacon, pork rinds, chicharrones, um, eggs, cheese, nuts sesame seeds. Those are excellent fat fortifiers. And start thinking continuously about pairing what you're about to eat with some fat fortifier. So if I'm eating a steak, 
I'll add butter to it. If I'm eating vegetables, I'll throw a, l- a lump of butter in there. If I'm cooking shrimp or crab legs, I'll saute them, and then I'll have a little bowl of melted butter, and I'll dip them in there before I eat them. If I'm eating a hamburger, I'll eat the burger. I may throw some lettuce, tomatoes, onions on it, and those are all fine. Um, and I'll add some cheese, or I may even add an egg to it. If I'm eating Brussels sprouts, I uh, fry my Brussels sprouts in oil, and I'll throw an egg on there just to bind them. There's ways you can add stuff, particularly cheese. You can add it to anything you're eating. Fat fortify. And the goal is to get into ketosis. So let me just back up for one second. There's one critical thing that the dietitians love to tell us. They love to quantify the carbohydrates in vegetables. The human body does not absorb the carbohydrates from leafy green vegetables in large amounts. So vegetables are free. Vegetables are free. Vegetables are free. They have a very, very healthy, high nutrient value. Micronutrients, your vitamins, your minerals, are enriched in those vegetables. And particularly, if you're not comfortable eating organ meats, eat your vegetables. A couple of things about vegetables. In the addiction model, I've never met somebody who had a rough day and to satisfy to deal with that rough day, rushed to the fridge and picked out on broccoli. It doesn't happen. We do not overeat broccoli. We do not overeat the leafy green vegetables. So the only absolute no's are rice and potatoes. All the other vegetables, make it easy for yourself. Knock yourself out. Have as much of it as you want to. Oh, but what about corn and beans and peas? You know what? Yes, there is some soluble carbohydrate in there. You will absorb some. But it's never going to be enough to knock you out of ketosis. It's the one place where I do ask you to watch your portions just a little bit. Early on, if you can avoid them, that's fine. But down the road, their health value is tremendous and the downside is not there. And that's kind of where I do agree with the vegans just a little bit. Some of those beans do have some healthy stuff in them. Um, Yes, they've got carbohydrates, but it's never enough to cause you harm. Remember, in the addiction model, it's excess and it's repeat, repeat visits. I've never, even in my Hispanic population, met somebody who piled a plate up this high with beans without rice and ate them. The rice and the potatoes are always no, and so is, the, so is the sweet potato. It's on my no list at this stage. But vegetables are free, then you don't have to count carbohydrates. You don't, oh, what's this number? What's this number? I want you to have awareness, but by category, vegetables are free. That differs very much in the addiction model from the harm reduction model. It's not about those carbs. can't group them out, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm willing to take that on with anybody. So what you want to do is you want to get to zero carbohydrates progressively, and you want to increase the, the fat component of what you're eating and have fat fortifiers available at all times. Why is that important? Here's why it's important. Because we want you to be in ketosis. Your body's not going to be a fat adapted yet. It's not going to be very effective at using ketones. And that's why your breath's going to stink. Um, you're going to smell. You're going to have those horrible excess ketones. You're going to pee purple because your body's going to be shedding that because it can't use them all. Interestingly, once you fat adapt, your breath gets better. You don't pee them out because your body's using them. Your body doesn't want to pee out the energy. It wants to use it, but at first it can't use it. Once your pee starts lightening up, it doesn't mean you're out of ketosis. It just means you're not using them. You're not, you're not peeing them out. You're using them more. So we'll get there when you're in deep ketosis. But at first, you'll stink, you'll smell it, you'll taste it, you'll feel it. Okay? So get yourself into ketosis. And here's the critical reason. Because any time you eat particularly soluble fat, like olive oil or butter or something like that, for the first time in your life, you're going to feel what it feels like to feel full. The problem is, when we're eating carbohydrates, there is no feedback sensation. So we, when we're hungry, we decide how much we're going to eat. And we put that in front of us, and we eat that food, and we will finish whatever's in front of us, whether we need it to or not. At a restaurant, whatever portion they put in front of you, I know I can kill it, and then some, because there's no feedback control, okay? The critical aspect of ketosis is that when fat enters your fat cells, it releases in a feedback pattern a hormone called leptin. Leptin is your satiety hormone that makes you feel full. The problem is, early on, we have to condition ourselves to feel leptin when it's very, very early on. Because leptin starts very slowly, about five to 10 minutes into a meal, and then slowly it rises and rises and rises. So leptin gets rid of the hunger. So the critical thing about ketosis is you don't feel hungry. 
but you've got to connect with it. And we don't connect automatically. Okay, we don't connect automatically. So the next little bit, the next few strategies are to connect with leptin. Because if you override the early parts of leptin, you're going to overeat and you're going to have those excess calories and you're going to feel miserable. I'm stuffed, I'm full. And if you're eating too much fat, it's going to make you feel like crap. You're going to, you're going to have diarrhea. You're going to get into that keto flu side of things. So you want to recognize, even though the percentage of what you're eating is very high in fat, you don't want to eat a lot but you don't want to be hungry because the greatest fear of a fat person is, oh, I'm going to be hungry. So the next strategy is called eating sequentially. Remember I said that what you want to do is sit at a table with a plate of food and a knife and fork. But here's what you want to do. Your brain, when you're at home, is always going to decide how much it thinks you need to eat. And if you're only eating a, a couple of meals a day, your brain is going, oh, I'm going to be hungry, and it over dishes up food. If you put that food in front of you, even if it's 70% fat, you're going to eat more than you needed to, and you're going to feel stuffed, and you're going to feel miserable, especially early on, and that's going to contribute to some of the symptoms of the keto flu. So here's what I want you to do. Eat sequentially. Take that food that you think you need and put it in the middle of the table. Get a tiny little plate, maybe a saucer. It's artificial, but get a little saucer, the one with a little hole in the middle and dish up a tiny amount of food into that saucer. Even if I'm eating a boiled egg, I'll cut it into quarters and dish up a quarter. And here's what you're doing. You're connecting your brain with your stomach for the first time in your life. And you're also forcing yourself to think and to slow down. If you eat like a Rottweiler having breakfast, and it's gone, you've way overeaten, and the leptin feedback will be blown out the water and you'll feel miserable. But if you go back, and you can go back as often as you want to, you can go back seven or eight times, you can eat everything. But invariably, here's what's going to happen. You'll eat a little bit. Ooh, how do I feel? I'm still hungry. I'll have another piece. And what you do is you fat fortify what's on your plate. So I don't put my mayo on the egg if I'm making egg salad. I take that little piece, I put my mayo on here, and I prepare that. It's buying me a bit of time. I eat that tiny amount, but I've got my soluble fat here. If I'm eating a salad, my salad is in the middle of the table, put a little bit on my plate, and I'll add my olive oil to the salad over here. So what it does is that there's a lot more soluble fat. There's those fat fortifiers on there, and they get into your bloodstream very quickly. It also slows you down. So you eat a little bit. I'm still hungry. You go back. You go back. Very quickly, within five to ten minutes of starting that meal, you know what? I'm kind of full. I haven't eaten very much, so I'm afraid I'm going to be hungry in ten minutes because that's what happens with carbohydrates. Try to allay that fear. Allow leptin to make you feel full. And if you're eating sequentially, you're going to feel that leptin much earlier into the eating process. So here's what you do. You know what? I think I'm full. I'm not sure. I'm a bit afraid. But there's still a lot of food left in the middle. I'm going to take that food and either leave it on the table or I'm going to put it back in the fridge. Just remember, this is in the early parts, the early parts to keto adapting. So that if you do get hungry in 10 minutes, guess what? Go back and eat some more. But invariably, within 10 to 15 minutes of eating, of beginning to eat, you'll feel satiated. Not stuffed, but you'll feel, hey, I've had enough. Stop there. Trust the leptin that it's going to continue to rise, and it'll keep you full. The next thing is, as soon as you feel full, get up and do something. Go and put the food back in the fridge. Go and, go and uh, do the dishes. Go and play a game of cards. Here's why. Because what follows dinner is the need to relax. And dessert is a fat person's way of relaxing. So if you're sitting at that table, you're probably going to pick and pick and pick and eat more or desire dessert. But remember, it's an emotional event. So get up and go and do something. Take the garbage out. Do something. And you will have an endorphin rush from what you're doing. You don't need the dessert to do that for you. And I bet you a tiny amount will satisfy you and keep you full in a long time. So eating sequentially is the way you connect. Now, if you're at a restaurant, if you're by yourself at a restaurant, the, the game of the restaurant is to leverage hunger. So you're hungry, they give you the menu. I'm hungry. You order the starter, you order the entree because you know they're going to take the menu away. Now you've overordered. What the hell do you do with that food? Because it's carbohydrates, you overeat it. And here's the key thing. Even if there's only a small amount, let's say you've got a big fat steak, but you've got some mashed potatoes, you're still going to overeat. I'll give you an example. If you drink water, your body will tightly control water. But if you put that same water in a little bit of whiskey, or you put a little bit of whiskey in the water, the whiskey will dominate. 
and you'll be able to drink endless amounts of water as long as you're getting the whiskey. Exactly the same thing that mashed potatoes does for steak. You eat endless amounts, you way overeat because of the carbohydrates. When there's just the steak and you're eating sequentially, you'll be fine. So at a restaurant, the way to play the game is this. Always order a starter if you're by yourself. Make sure it's keto, and they've always got butter or mayo, or olive oil at the restaurant. Get some of that fat fortified. But tell the waiter this. Bring me the starter. I'm sorry, man. I was on the phone. I was, uh, I, I was talking to my friends. Let me keep the menu. They're not going to run out of food while you're sitting there. At least the restaurants I go to are not going to run out of food while I'm sitting there. So now you've kept all your options open. They bring the starter. You've got the menu. You finish that. You may be full. You may want another starter. You may want a different one. You may want uh, an entree. You may eat some leftovers. You've kept all those options open, but now you're eating for leptin. You're not eating because your head said, I'm hungry. And you'll way under eat and still be full. That's the way to eat out. The other option when I go out with my family, we'll order one entree for the middle of the table. Everybody dishes up. And then you can order more if you need some. It's called eating sequentially. And it helps you to connect with leptin. And guess what? You're going to eat a tiny amount. And what's that called? Portion control. But it's not intentional portion control. It's biofeedback portion control. And you'll never be hungry. You'll never feel you're in starvation. And you will never, ever fail on that until you go back to the carbohydrates. So that's the second thing I want you to develop. The third aspect. And it's this wonderful new sexy thing that everybody's talking about out there. It's a great way to, to do portion control. It's just a new formula for portion control. What's it called? Intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is just a way to eat less in a 24-hour period. It's an intentional form of caloric reduction when you're eating carbohydrates. The problem with carbohydrates is your blood sugar is going up and down. Every time your blood sugar comes down, you're hungry. And what happens? You eat. So now you're intentionally not eating and you feel like crap. You're starving yourself. It's unsustainable. So yeah, you lose some weight while you're intentionally starving yourself, but it's unsustainable in the long run. Here's what intermittent fasting is. Intermittent fasting is just not eating. And the value of, of leptin is not only to get you eat a small amount, but remember, it keeps you full for a long period of time. Everybody, everybody wakes up in ketosis. So why the hell eat breakfast? It's the least important meal of the day. So the first rule when, you, when you're doing intermittent fasting is try not to eat breakfast. Now, if you have to eat breakfast, it's the most important meal in your day. Have breakfast, but make sure it's bacon and eggs and eat it sequentially. But for the most part in my life, I'll have a cup of coffee for breakfast. And then I try to ride that wave of ketosis as deep into the day as I can. You then plan on eating one dominant meal. Usually for me, that's my dinner, and it's going to happen sometime at night, and I preordain that so I can look forward to that. So even if I'm a little bit hungry during the day, I know my dinner is an hour away, I can push through. If I wasn't going to eat, if I didn't know what the hell I was going to have for dinner and I'm hungry, I'm going to McDonald's and I'm crashing and burning. So plan your dinner. If you want to, plan another meal, your first meal in the middle of the day. It can be anywhere. It can be 12 o'clock, it can be 1 o'clock, it can be 3 o'clock. But remember that all of your eating should be done in a six to eight hour window. That's what intermittent fasting is, to have two meals in a narrow window, six to eight hours. And in fact, when it comes to fat people, we're obsessed about eating. But the goal of intermittent fasting is not the time period where you're eating. It's the length of time, the 16 plus hours through the day and through the night when you're sleeping, where you're not consuming calories. So here's the way the body works. No matter what you eat, protein, carbohydrates, or fat, preferably just fat and protein, it goes into your bloodstream and the liver absorbs that out of your bloodstream. The liver will always, first and foremost, preferentially, store some of that energy. And the liver will convert that to a little bit of glycogen, which is sugar because the liver is your first responder. It's the quarterback of the metabolic system and will always, during and after a meal, store some glycogen irrespective of what you just ate, even if you ate fat. The rest of it will be converted to fat and stored in your fat cells. Then after a meal, the first step is your liver delivers when your blood, when your blood energy, or especially your blood sugar drifts down, your liver under the influence of glycogen delivers some of those calories the carbohydrates, the glycogen, to the liver as glucose. Oh, sorry, to the bloodstream as glucose. Once the liver is depleted, and typically it takes about three to four hours after a meal for the liver to become depleted, 
once the liver is depleted, it's going to send out a very powerful signal that says, I need more calories. And what's that signal? It says eat. So you get a little bit hungry. If you don't eat during that time, if leptin's working and it suppresses that appetite call, then the liver has to get energy from somewhere else. Where does it go to? If it doesn't go to your mouth, it goes to your fat cells, particularly if your insulin level is low and you're able to release that fat from the liver, at least from the fat cells. So you go into ketosis. And if your dinner meal is your big meal, if you're eating your big meal at night, then that conversion, that liver emptying happens when you're asleep. So you don't wake up and go to the fridge and eat. Some fat people do. But you transition into ketosis while you're asleep. And then if your liver stays empty and it's using the fat and ketones, your hunger is gone because along with that fat coming out of your cells, out comes leptin, and you can sustain not eating for a very, very long period of time. The key thing to remember with obesity is that once we do start eating, that fluctuation begins, even if it's ketosis, and there's kind of this push to eat a little bit more. So the longer you can ride the wave of not eating, the better you're going to be. Now, the misery is the endorphin effect of, oh, I need something. Guess what? That's where my coffee comes in. I don't drink coffee. I sip it about every 20 minutes in my office between patients. After each patient visit, I'm sipping my coffee. If you work in front of a computer, set your watch about every 20 to 30 minutes. Have a sip of that coffee. It helps to quell the, the emotions, but also helps to quell that need for something, plus it maintains your hydration. So have your coffee available, even if there's just a little bit of cream. Don't do the bulletproof or the high-fat coffee yet. Um, and then plan those two meals. So if you're doing that intermittent fasting, there's a long period of time where your liver is going, going to your fat cells for its source of energy. But remember, you've got to empty your liver first. So let's look at liver emptying for the fourth stage. The fourth thing that I'm looking for you to do as you start to do this is frequent bits of physical activity. Now, I'm using the word physical activity. I'm specifically not using the word exercise. Physical activity are little things that we do that tell the liver, I may be doing something big, push some energy into your bloodstream. So if you're in a parking lot, park a couple of spaces further away and walk those extra 10 seconds in. Your liver doesn't know if you're going to go for a 10 or 20 second walk or if you're going to go run a marathon, so it preemptively releases some of that energy into the bloodstream to accommodate for that work. In the morning, I make my bed. There are opportunities throughout the day to do little bits of physical activity. Parking your car further away, carrying a basket when you're shopping instead of pushing a cart, doing a set of stairs instead of the escalator, skipping and not stepping on the cracks on the sidewalk, silly little games that you can play, taking the garbage out yourself, going to get the mail, taking the dog for a walk instead of just opening the door and letting the dog out. Throughout the day, if you troll for little moments of physical activity, most importantly, you're emptying that liver and you're accelerating access to your fat cells. But the other value, the other huge value of those little bits of physical activity is they replace the two M&Ms that I used to eat for this when I was fat. So they become a very powerful endorphin alternative. They don't have to be big. It's little moments here. It's, there. it's like a puff on a cigarette, a puff on a cigarette. A little thing, a little thing, a little thing. And if you can have 15 to 20 um, physically active moments in your day, where you get up and you walk down the corridor to go and talk to a colleague instead of texting them or typing them. As I said, you take the garbage out. Little, little opportunities present them all the time. Present to yourself the ability to be physically active. And if you leverage that, you're going to empty your liver, you're going to maintain your ketosis, and you're going to do that fat burn. It's not there to lose weight, but it's there to keep the liver empty. So the four things we're looking for you to do is progressively in four stages, work to zero carbs and increase your fat consumption. The protein will always come along for the ride. Add salt to your food. The second thing is learn to eat sequentially so that you can connect with leptin at the earlier stages. And as part of that, never eat for longer than 20 minutes at any one time. Most meals should be able to be completed in 10 to 15 minutes because the leptin will work. The third thing is the so-called intermittent fasting or just eating once, maybe twice a day. And the fourth thing is frequent physical activity to adjust that system, to, make an, to create a slight energy demand to get the liver to release its energy. You put those four things together, you will get into deep ketosis pretty quickly. Now remember, it takes anywhere from six weeks to three months 
for your cells to stop requiring sugar as a primary fuel source and to ramp up the systems, the pathways that burn fat, that burn ketones. That's a process that happens slowly. So stick to this, enhance it, build it up. But remember, no matter what, your energy level, your, your mind, your frustrations, your emotions are going to take a step sideways for a while. You're going to go through the first phase is what I call the divorce of the deprivation phase. Both your body and your mind are going to feel deprived. It's almost like, as I said, killing your best friend. But once you start to adapt to that, and it takes about 21 days, three weeks, for you to really start to feel that change, to get into that early stage of ketosis, and then up to 90 days to get into deep ketosis, during that transformation, you're going to feel really, really good. And that's what we're looking for, getting through the divorce and the deprivation phase into what I call the success phase, where you see a measurable change in your health, an improvement. You see a measurable change on the scale. You see a measurable change in your blood pressure, in your heart rate. All of those things get better. And then the second phase is to consolidate that as part of deep ketosis and learn to live in ketosis. We'll talk about that next time. Okay. I haven't got as many questions as last time. Does that does that make some sense to you? Does that do you follow no, along there? No. Okay. Totally, yeah. I mean change of mindset. Um you you were talking about the fact that it's you and what I found so amazing is how how intensely our our brains are trained to think a particular way. I mean a, a, as this athlete trained by our buddy Tim Noakes, um, thinking that carbo loading was, was, was what it was all about, um, I was so paranoid about eating fat because mm -hmm. that, that I remember it like trimming off every single tiny little piece of flat fat off a piece of steak before I'd even cook it, you know. Um, and just the, the sight of fat, Mm -hmm. made me made me feel queasy you know um and when we first started i did this three weeks of studying and everything and decided okay this explained all my problems and everything and i decided to try and do this the very very first meal pam and i ever had i went outside and i cooked two big ribeye steaks mm -hmm. that had these huge pieces of fat in amongst them and I cooked them and I put them on a plate and I came back into the kitchen and I was standing there in front of Pam with this plate, with all this fat on the steak and this fat was like sloshing around in the bottom underneath right. on the plate. And I actually started giggling. It, it was, it, it, was, it was so, so disgusting. Yeah, looking. it was so yeah. inconceivable huh? that I was really going to eat this. Right. Um, and so, I cut the first few pieces and I, and I literally had to force it down. Right. Because and, I was, and you started I, with too much. But you it just, was, but it was like, I, I felt like I, I wanted to regurgitate. This exactly thing. right. Exactly right. Be, because I, but it was my brain. I ate a bit and then after a while I ate a bit more. And then after a while I started to think, you know what? This actually tastes pretty good. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and, and then you realize that having taken all this fat out of everything, turned everything into cardboard, which is the reason that they add sugar to everything is to mm -hmm. try and give stuff some taste. Flavor. Now that they've, exactly right. Yeah. Um, and, and, now I, and now I see that same plate and I start salivating. Yeah. But, um, uh, but that's the transformation, Doug. You're abs and you were somebody who knew you had to do this. When I'm seeing patients who come into me, they just want to lose weight. Right. And I start talking about eating fat. There's that cognitive dissonance. So when I talked about the fat fortifiers, and that's why I focused on that, while most people are going to struggle to eat that big lump of fat, the ribeye, um, they're not going to have a problem maybe converting from light mayo to regular mayo and chopping up a, a, a white chicken breast without the skin and adding mayo to it. Mm. So that's the first, you know, it's a stepwise thing. Right. And then maybe down the road, chop the skin up with it or eat with dark meat or eat. Most people eat chicken wings. Just get some naked chicken wings and eat those. Most people don't have a problem eating avocado. Most people don't have a problem eating cheese, at mm -hmm. least in America. The Chinese have an issue with that. So we start with incorporating that 
Yeah. Maybe if I'm making, I'll buy my own mincemeat and I'll mush it up and make my own meatballs or burgers with it. But I'll always take two or three eggs and crack it in there. You can camouflage the egg very readily. Right. So we use that as a way to introduce fat into their diet. Maybe places where you use margarine, add a little bit of, of, uh, um, of, of uh, butter to it. If you're going to do, as I said, uh, the Brussels sprouts, we chop them up into quarters and we fry them in a pan. Maybe add some olive oil to them and they come out nice and crispy. And if you don't like that, uh, then add an egg to it to bind it. And you get, so. Well, put a, a bunch, of, fat put fortify. A bunch of cheese on it. Then it tastes right, great. exactly. Smother it with cheese. So you can fat fortify without having that level of disgust for the ribeye. Right. And then slowly you can introduce that. Yeah, you know, Janae gonna... doesn't like ribeye. She'll eat the filet, but she'll fat fortify the hell out of it. Right. So, so that's the other way to do it. I, I must admit that I, I got over it like really quickly. <laughs> Yeah, I know, and so did I. I mean, will, will take longer, but right. I was like, I, I, I think when I was really young, we used to eat all of this stuff, and I think I told mm-hmm. the story where my mom used to have this enamel tub in the in the fridge with all the lard and left, you know, and she just used to, and she used to take a, a spatula and a, like take a hunk right. out of that and put it in the pan and cook stuff in it, and, and then suddenly. You know, the McGovern Commission told her that, that she was killing us. And, and mm-hmm. so that, that all went away. So I was exposed to that in, my, in the first few years of my life. And then it was taken away from me. Right. And I was taught that it was going to kill me. And 40 years later, I got back to eating it again. And, right. But I, I, think I, I think that... Um, you were already programmed. You were, yeah, it was already I think I remembered that, right. that, that great flavor. And so that, maybe that's why I got back so quickly. Yeah. yeah. But always remember, Doug, that what I've just talked about is an introduction to keto eating because you've got to make it comfortable. Right. Remember that what we were talking specifically about here is people who come to me for weight loss. Mm. And these people are experts in seco diets and, and in harm reduction diets. Right. What you're trying to do here is to get them to slowly get comfortable with a that with the fact that the pathway to losing weight is actually eating the very thing they're trying to lose, which is yeah. fat. And so if you can slowly introduce it, you know, for example, just getting them, and then there's two parts to this. The first part, the most important part for fat people is to get rid of the carbohydrates. Okay. And quite frankly, early on, I don't care if they're still eating lean protein, but get rid of the sugar that you're drinking, yeah. get rid of the sugar. Totally. And then slowly you can start flavoring food. So I don't say eat fat. Start flavoring your food with fat, which is the way it used to be flavored. Exactly. And that is, I'll put some cheese and, and, and avo in my salad. I'll, I'll, you know what I even tell people? Oh, I love ranch dressing. So, okay, take your ranch dressing, make sure it's not light. Add some olive oil to your ranch dressing and mix it in. You won't even know that it's there. Yeah. So you slowly introduce fat. It doesn't have to be like this. Mm. And that's a, but what you bring up is a critical thing. You intended to eat fat. They just want to lose fat. Right. So you've got to get them, get them used to the concept. Otherwise, you lose them. And, and too much the keto evangelists, oh, you've got to eat this. The fat's so good. Well, it tastes like crap. I hate it. Okay? Get rid of the – and, and we, what we've lost focus on, we're so focused on the fat, we've lost focus that the problem is the carbohydrates. Right. Get rid of those first. Totally. I mean, that's, that's rule number one. Sugar yeah. first, then all the other carbohydrates, and then, and then everything else. Right. Um, mayo. We talked yes. about going to, to full fat mayo and all of that, but one of the things that concerns me about most mayos is that they have such crappy oils in them. Yes, I agree. Um, so there are a couple. I think Chosen Foods is the one. Chosen Foods makes a great one. It's the avocado one. The right. problem with the Chosen Foods, it's a little bit tangy. So you yeah. and I who are used to the tangy one. From remember South that Africa? mayonnaise that we used yeah. to eat in South Africa? What was it called? The one in the lions or something, right? Yeah, whatever it was. But cross but in and this blackwell. Country, cross and blackwell. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It was a really good that deep yellow color. Mm. Here they're not used to like Janae hates that tangy stuff. Right. I actually bring the cross and blackwell back for me and my son from South Africa. Mm. But you know, again, the same thing is true. I still want people to fat adapt. I want them to get used to eating mayo. Now, once they're good at this. Once they're in, and this is something I, I met with a lot of patients today that were fat adapted. I tell them to make your own mail. Yeah, well, I was about to, that, was, that, yeah. that, was, that was the point of writing this down was right. where I was make trying to get own. to you. Is that I, we, we started making our own mail and it's, it's way easier than, yeah. than you think. And it's, Absolutely it is. And now, like, we can add, I add quite a lot of extra vinegar to it. <laughs> 
in order right. to give it that tanginess that I'm used to mm -hmm. and that I like. Mm -hmm. But you you can. But that's a choice. You, yes, you, you right. can adjust it to and and create the taste that that you really love. But right. you know that it's got really really good fats and a couple of eggs and stuff in it. It's it, it's really good yeah. stuff. But you see, the first step for me is to get my patients away from the concept that light is good. Right. So you want to go from light ranch to, to regular fat. ranch. Right. You want to go from light mayo to full fat mayo. Right. And you know, if it's if it's got crappy fats in it, at least you're getting used to the fat. And then, so it's, this is a stepwise approach. And if they come in and they're proud of the fact they're eating Hellman's, then you say, okay, let's try to make our own. Right. Yeah. That's, so you see how, you see how that works? So, so the, the whole method here when you're working clinically, especially when, and this is specifically of obese people, don't overwhelm them. All right. Don't overwhelm them. Let them do the easy things, even though they're not perfect. Mm hmm and then, I mean, I'd yeah. much rather, it's the same as in a Diet Coke. What is better, but a Diet Coke is fine. And then clean it up one, one thing at a time. And clean it up, correct, exactly right. So that's the approach there. Yeah, okay. Um, go, to go back to the vegetables, you, you talk yes. about vegetables being free. Um, I, would, I, I kind of get that with, with like the leafy greens, the spinach and kale and, and right. broccoli and stuff like that. But you mentioned things like, Corn and carrots, stuff. corns, peas, beans. Yes. So why? Why? When you're dealing with a fat person and okay. you're trying to tell them to eat keto, right? You know what the first? Because remember, eighty to ninety percent of what they eat is carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So the very first question is, well, what the hell do I eat? <laughs> what okay. the hell do I eat? And if you make it too strict, they're just never going to do it. Okay. So the most important thing, the biggest enemy. When it comes to the range of vegetable stuff, the biggest enemy are the grain-containing stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. And you've got to tell them that quinoa is as bad as white bread right. exactly. and, and rice and potatoes. Particularly in my Latino population, they just can't get away from rice and potatoes. Right. So if I say, but most of the Latinos will eat rice and beans. So if I say, get rid of the rice. Just have the beans. Keep the beans. Right. And they won't overeat the beans. Yeah. So yeah, no, again, it's, okay. what, what this is about is about prag pragmatism. Mm. And then over time, we move them away from the starchy vegetables. Okay. But if you okay. give them nothing to eat, they're screwed. Yeah, no, okay. okay? That, that so so sense, understand yeah. that what, what I'm doing is, I, I, again, I, I try to stay, and, and the second one that we'll tape on this will be, okay, now you're a keto evangelist. Let's look at the nuances. Yeah, Let's okay. look at some of the tweaks, okay? Yeah. Uh, that's where we start talking about grass-fed is better than, than uh, corn-raised. Yeah. Uh, that's we, but at first, I just want them to get rid of the carbohydrates. But even that... Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. But just to go back to the grass-fed thing, mm -hmm. um, that's, I, I feel very, very strongly about that, that there may be, and I believe, only really minor differences in, in terms of nutritional concepts with between grass fed and, and grain finished but whatever um there's always a big difference in price exactly and and, and i i would be livid if i ever found out that someone decided that they couldn't do keto because they couldn't afford grass-fed beef well, you know, one uh, of the there's a lot of people that are trying to tell that tell everyone yes, that this yes, has right. to be grass fed, and right. that is right. So I'll give an bullshit. example of what you, I have that, to that's do. That's the word you use, now. right? Bullshit. Absolutely, absolutely. But I'm a doctor. I'm allowed to use it. You know. Okay. So you no. use it for me. Yeah. No, no, no. But but here's an interesting thing. I've just you know with this with this government shutdown, yeah. I had a lot of patients patients, especially in Jacksonville, who are government employees, mm -hmm. and they the common thing, especially early on, they tell me keto is too expensive. Yeah. So I said, okay, guys, okay, let's eat. And it was a challenge that I did in late December. Well, it really was January, the, the early part of January. Let's eat for less than $10 a day. So if you figure it out, a whole chicken at Walmart, at least in, in Florida, mm -hmm. cost four seventy five between four twenty five and four seventy five. Right. That's a whole chicken. Yeah. A Big Mac sandwich is five seventy five. Just a sandwich. Okay. Right. So yeah. you're getting a whole chicken. You can get some canned vegetables. Okay, canned vegetables are not necessarily great. Or you can get your, your, your frozen mixed vegetables. A big bag is a bucket Walmart. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we try to figure out how can we make this happen pragmatically because cost is an issue for a lot right. of our people. Okay. And, and, 
It's serious. And, and I agree completely with you. I, I'm in a situation, I mean, you know, since I started this, we've, we've been bootstrapping this thing. We don't have any money. And, right. And like, we, go to, we go to Stater Brothers and they have yeah. these manager specials in, the, in this little corner there. And, right. you know, I, I go in there and there's these big bone in ribeye steaks for three ninety nine a pound or something. Yeah. And they normally uh-huh. sell for 22 or 23. Right. And I just take the whole the whole bunch of trays and <laughs> and take them out. Yeah. yeah, I bought a bunch of ribeye steak the other day that was all on special on on for sale. Now it was maybe a day or two old, but hell, it's okay. No, but and as, I, long, I as, it, as long as it hasn't expired, you can freeze yeah. it and, yeah. and take them out one at a time. And yeah, if it's not too yeah. green, I'll eat it. But but the point there is is we've got to make it cost effective. And yeah. in fact, what I tell them because a lot of these patients are going to pay for other things within six months just by what you're not eating you're going to save a ton of money. Absolutely. And, and, and it's about the cost savings, not that it's expensive to eat that way. Exactly. And there, there are ways, like with the manager specials and that, that you can mm-hmm. actually find decent meats in that for, for cheaper than, than you right. can buy the burger. And, and remember, the other concept that we have is that frozen vegetables are often better than the fresh vegetables that are shipped in from California to Florida because they have to pick them unripe and they don't, ri- they don't get all the nutrients in once they've been picked. The frozen right. vegetables are picked and frozen and flash frozen at the peak of their right. of so their uh, yeah. Or that yeah. So that's an interesting concept. Is, yeah. So you know, there's no and the, and the frozen vegetables are dirt cheap. Right. Yeah. And they don't spoil. You know, you can freeze them and you can keep the, eat them a month later. I yeah. ate frozen vegetables the other night that have been in the fridge for two years. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you know, they may have lost something. They may have lost a step, but hey, it was fine. Exactly. And we, I mean, we. To be honest, we, you know, we. Most of the vegetables, if, if we do vegetables, are, are frozen because we just, mm-hmm. it's, it's more convenient, you know. It's absolutely, you stick in the microwave and you stick some butter yeah, on it, it's like, fine. Yeah, it, it, so, and, and I think that's my biggest message here is, is as much as I really love to support the, the farmers who want to do the grass-fed beef and, and look after their cows and all of that, that's wonderful. And if you can afford that, then support that. But do not tell people and do not believe that you can't do keto if you can't afford grass fed because you can't afford grass fed beef. Right. Or, or but, but here's the other part, Doug. You know, you know, if you're eating pizza every day, if you're eating pasta every day, you're not supporting any damn farmers. Yeah. You're supporting manufacturers. <laughs> so, and, and you'll see that the next phase we're going to talk about is okay, now you want to be a keto evangelist. What are the best sources? Then we're going to talk about uh, um, free-range eggs, the value of free range. We're talking about non-GMOs. We're going to talk about the, the non-arsenic uh, foods. We're going to talk about all of those things in that second part where you spend a little bit more. But you know what? what what's a lot of fun with people that have some money is to go to a farmer's market and source your own stuff locally, mm. to go out to the farm and, and get some friends and buy the cow. And I think and, what and how fi- you do that. And I think what you find is that once you're adapted – and you've converted. What you mentioned earlier was that you find that you're eating a whole lot less. You're not eating five, six meals a day. Correct. You're, you're saving money just from And so, and now suddenly you realize, you know what? I'm actually not spending the money that I was spending before. I've actually got some right. left over. And now you can start looking at, at, at spreading your wings a bit and, and delving into maybe some slightly more expensive yeah. options. So, so the, the biggest change that you make when you're eating sequentially You've got to be comfortable eating leftovers. Yeah. But then you're taking one plate of food and you're eating it twice. So it's costing you almost nothing. Uh, we, we have leftovers all the time. And right. We? But you've got to be comfortable eating them or reprocessing them. Yeah. Um, so you yeah, know, th- those, are, those are all the values. And you, you want to sell that. Value. Now, the places are splurge. For example, I will buy fresh Brussels sprouts. They're a little bit more expensive, but I love them. Right. Um, but all the other stuff, you know, I just buy the stuff frozen. Yeah. And, um, and you can do really, really well with that. Yeah, I agree. Okay, this was awesome. Um, so now we're going to do a similar one for type 1 diabetes. And we're going to do, uh, it's slightly different because we've got to take into account eating for, trying to get into keto to reduce your A1C and then for type 2s as well. Okay. And the, the diets are slightly different. I've got different sheets for each of those. All right. Yeah.